Alim Agrawal, uh, Professor Alim is a well-known figure in the world worldwide. Actually, he's a professor of medicine at Ohio University in the state, and he is a head of uh, International Society of Diagnostic and Interventional Nephrology. Uh, Dr. Alim will uh, talk about a crucial issue regarding the strategies to avoid custard for dialysis access. And I hope after this presentation, and we shall we will inshallah uh, to offer our patient the right uh, access to the right person at the right time. Professor Ali, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, honorable chairpersons, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, so as you heard, a very thought-provoking talk by Professor Al Kori just now. Uh, unfortunately, despite all the best efforts, well. Uh, you can call those best best efforts probably not enough. Uh, we still have very high incidence of ESRD, and uh, I think it would be very important to uh, understand how you can get a good vascular access at the start of dialysis. I, I, as far as I know, in Egypt, most pe people still start with catheters, just like in the United States, and that's not really a good scenario. So, so here is the situation. This is from USRDS data, the United States Renal Data System. Uh, as you can see at the initiation of dialysis, about 80% of the patients, 80%. Uh, so, so these are the patients in the green, just with the catheter. These are with a, uh, a few people with AV, AV graft and a catheter, and these are the people with AV fish line and a catheter. So about 80% of people start dialysis with a catheter, which is not a good scenario because we know that the catheters are not uh, good vascular access. And, and this is really uh, very significant because there is a five-fold greater mortality within the first 90 days of dialysis. Within the first, nine, first three months, there is a five-fold higher mortality in patients who start with a catheter. And this is not necessarily because we don't have a good access. This is not a technology issue. It is the problem with how we do things, how our processes are. Uh, we are not communicating well, we're not educating well, we don't have pieces of the puzzle in place to put in a good access. So it's a failure of what we call processes of care. If you have studied operations anywhere, it is the processes which are very, very important. No matter how well you are trained and educated, if you don't have processes, you will not be able to succeed in your uh, mission. So uh, why catheters need to pour out? Because there are a number of reasons. Number one, there, there is a higher inflammation with a foreign body sitting in there. There is a higher incidence of infection. There are more thrombosis and stenosis, uh, uh, stenosis of the veins. When the catheter sits in there, I, I spoke yesterday as well, uh, the catheter has a contact time with the vessel wall. Uh, there is endothelial inflammation and a fibrotic reaction, and a thrombotic reaction, and, and that leads to uh, a complete collapse of the blood vessel there. And the catheters are associated with malfunction, poor KT over B, poor blood flow. So, so those are not good scenarios for catheter. And plus, there is a selection bias as well. I must say, uh, some people just get catheters because they could not get AV fistula because they were so sick. So this leads to significant morbidity and mortality in hemodialysis patients. Uh, at the same time, as I was telling you, within the first 90 days, there is a five-fold higher mortality. Within, within about 45 days or so, there is a 15% infection rate. Six weeks, you, you get a catheter infection. You just place the catheter, it is infected. So that's not a very good scenario for anybody, uh, leave alone the patient who just started Dialysis. Dialysis is an overwhelming situation. Somebody who goes from a normal person who, who is doing everything right uh, and at this point uh, they are totally dependent on their parents uh, with the process of dialysis and there are social issues, there are emotional issues. Of course the health issues are generally people are sick, they were, they were just out of ICU. This is not a good time to have an infection either. Not that there is a good time any, any time, other time either. Uh, so, so the, the bottom line is that there is a five-fold higher increase in mortality in people who do dialysis with a catheter. This, this line is with catheter. And this is with hemodialysis and PD with a fistula. This is a study from Jeffrey Berlin, uh, Canada. Yeah, and essentially, it seems like quite a bit of the mortality that comes uh, within the first 90 days is related to the catheters yeah, rather than the fistula. So, so once again, patients with a catheter die quicker they cost more. Uh, 
So there is a much higher cost of patients uh, who dialyze with a catheter about $80,000 uh, in the U.S. within the first year. A patient dependent with the catheter. On the catheter, if you have a graft or a fistula, uh, you have much less cost. And, and patients with fistula and graft then live longer and cost less. So um, I know Egypt is a very, very rich country, so they can afford to have all their cost. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, at least in the United States, they don't feel they have enough money. So how should you uh, choose vascular access? Oh, well, Trump is rich, but uh, okay. They're choosing vascular access. How should you choose your vascular access? The vascular access should be individualized, like anything else. It should be individualized. You should not just put in something as a last-minute option because we have two dialysis, we have nothing else. All we have got is a catheter. That that is not a good situation. It should not be a mandate from guidelines also. You remember the Fischla first, um, I'm sure you heard Fischla first. Fischla first was a, uh, something in the United States, they wanted to put Fischla in everybody. So even those people who did not have any pain, they were trying to just create a Fischla. What that did is that kept people on the catheter for the longest period of time, because the Fischla would not mature. Uh, so, so that it should not be a mandate. It should not be focused on any one type of access. You should not focus on just fistula, just graft, just catheter. Do what is the best for your patient and what is most appropriate for your patient. And that is how you should be treating your patient and I'm sure you try to do that. Uh, I think it's a good idea to have a catheter last option if you can. So instead of fistula first, put the catheter last because the catheters are not the best situation, uh, best type of access for anybody uh, except maybe the people who are very terminal and going to die uh, very soon and there's not enough time for fistula maturation. Generally they say you should have about a year uh, of life expectancy. Um, we are very indiscriminate in the United States at least in putting everybody on dialysis. I have patients who are on dialysis 90 years old and 95 years old uh, and people who have terminal cancers and uh, who are very, very sick. So that's probably not very appropriate either. So, so you should uh, take care of that. So what I am going to describe to you very quickly here uh, is nine very solid strategies that you can use to avoid a catheter. Not one, not two, nine. So the first one uh, is early rest. <laughs> I know that you don't have a lot of control on that. It, it requires education of the primary care physicians everywhere, the, um, the internists, the um, cardiologists, everybody else who, who is doing procedures on these people, uh, they need to know to refer the patient early. Uh, in the United States, you, you can see if you did, did not see any nephrologist, uh, there was about 90% catheter rate at the start of dialysis. Those people who saw a, any nephrologist, they, they had a high rate as well. But if they saw a nephrologist for a full year, they, they were only 62% catheter. I say that with some humility because nobody who has seen a nephrologist for a year should really have a catheter. So 62% is still very, very high. And that tells me that there is a process failure. It's not the nephrologist who doesn't know to put in a fish line. They just don't have the processes uh, in place. The strategy two is educate the patient. Uh, whose life is being affected by whatever we are doing. It's the patient, it's not your and my life, it's the patient. Uh, so if you teach the patients well, so there is a program called TOPS program or treatment options program that used to be uh, done by Fresenius and they got all the CKD4 patients and taught them what, what, what they are expecting at the uh, end of this kidney function. And people who were trained with TOPS, uh, they, they had much less number of catheters uh, 43 percent as opposed to those people who were not trained, they had 70, almost 79 percent. Fish law grafts were higher at the beginning of dialysis and started on home therapies, the uh, peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis more if they were treated, uh, if they were trained in TOPS. So what is the strategy number three? The strategy three is what I just showed you. It, the, the patients who were seeing nephrologists, they were not referred to surgeon promptly to make a fistula. So try to refer to the surgeon right away and now we have another option that you, you could actually use nephrologist uh, to create endovascular AV fistula. We, we have discussed that a couple times since yesterday, uh, which is a minimally invasive um, procedure. You don't have to 
depend on the surgical referral and operating room time. So uh, nephrologists can, when they get trained, uh, they can put in a fistula endovascularly in the lab in, in, in 20 minutes. Uh, and it, it does not require any anesthesia, no incisions, uh, no recovery time. And there is a very high success. Uh, there was a paper published just uh, this uh, last month uh, that showed two years uh, patency of almost 90% with the endovascular AVF, uh, which is way better than what we have ever heard. Uh, so this may be a good option. It's not for everyone. Uh, but uh, you should definitely be aware of that, that there is that possibility. So this is one type of, uh, you see this fistula. Uh, so this is, uh, you don't see any scar. There is a nice fistula. There is more than one outflow here as well. Uh, so this can be cannulated very soon. So the, one of the devices is the Everlink device you have seen yesterday. Uh, the one catheter goes in the vein, one goes in the artery. They have a magnet. The, the artery and vein are close. And uh, once one, uh, they are aligned, the magnets will stick. And then you deliver radio frequency. And with the radio frequency, you uh, cause the fusion and instant anastomosis. And you start seeing blood flow uh, going there. This was the uh, out of the seminal paper uh, by Sharon and Loke. Uh, this is the other device called the ellipsis device and uh, what this one does, you first puncture the artery, then puncture, the, uh, first puncture the vein, then through the vein you go into the artery and then put this device on it, it pulls the vein and artery together and then you apply thermal energy and you get fusion of the um, uh, artery and vein and creates uh, instant anastomosis. Both have their own, pro, own pros and cons but both can be done by interventional nephrologists. <laughs> Strategy four, very, very important. So once you start traumatizing the central veins, the central veins are not always very forgiving. They, they get a fibrotic reaction, uh, thrombosis, and there is eventually there is a bridge formation uh, between the walls, and you end up with a stenosis, and when the flow is blocked, then this is what happens to the fissure. So, so uh, as you can see, this person has a huge mega fistula here. You can see number of collaterals on the chest. Here, here is the vein uh, going in the head from, from the arm. The blood, instead of going into the heart, it's going there. It's all getting into the breast. So, so you get edema here. So you, you don't have to do any angiogram. You can just tell that this patient has almost complete occlusion of the central uh, vein. And this can happen very quickly, so don't think that you need a six month or a year of three catheters. This can happen with one or two catheters within uh, three months. So, so you have to be very careful when we are putting these 80, 90, 100% of uh, people uh, on dialysis with a catheter. This is what you're going to see, start seeing more. And anything you do for these, yes, there are a number of ways up, but this is one of my specialties uh, that I've written a lot about. Uh, there are a number of ways you can open these central veins, but eventually all those are going to stenose again. So, so there is really no treatment, if you ask me, there is really no treatment for central vein stenosis eventually. The strategy five is you salvage the fistula. So if you put the fistula, it's not maturing, uh, you can wait and wait and wait. Generally, if the, a fistula is not good at four to six weeks, you should be intervening with it. You, you, cannot, you cannot just sit and pray for it. It will never mature if it has not matured in four to six weeks. Uh, so, so you need to really intervene and do something about it. Uh, and that, this is an example. So the, this fistula was not really uh, maturing well. There was a stenosis here. Uh, and uh, the, this was angioplasty. And the fistula was able to be salvaged. Uh, the, this patient did come back again and had required another um, uh, angioplasty. But, but you can salvage these. There are accessory veins. You can ligate those. You can coil those. We did a workshop this morning. We showed the coil and how, to, how to, uh, that you can put that, that in. Strategy number six is uh, you can create a secondary AV fistula. Secondary AV fistula because it comes after the first AV fistula or a first access. So this patient was dialyzing using a graft, as you can see here. Yeah, but he had a beautiful vein going in the upper arm. Uh, so, if you are examining your patients on dialysis, you know that there is a vein which is already being matured by this, this graft. So, there is a lot of flow going there. This vein is matured. So, when, uh, when this graft started having issues, 
They just connected the brachial artery to this vein. They got instant fistula there. There was a very small period of catheter time, maybe less than a week, and this patient was able to use this fistula. So that you could use secondary AV fistula as a strategy. Another strategy is that if you do not have time to put in a fistula, because fistula does take four to six weeks of maturation at least. So, so what you can do is you can use uh, sometimes an early, uh, you can put in a graft which, which has only uh, two weeks of maturation time, but even if you don't have two weeks, you can use these rubberized uh, grafts. So usual PTFE, if you put a needle through, you take the needle out, there is a gaping hole and you get bleeding. So, so you don't want to use it before two weeks or so, so that uh, this gets incorporated in the tissue and the tissue will stop the bleeding. Uh, but if you have to use it right away, you can you can put in one of these rubberized drafts. There, there are a number of those, the Flexine, the Accuseal, the uh, Vectra, uh, there are a number of those. Uh, they close by, as you take the needle out, within five seconds, this thing closes. So, so you could use it potentially the next day or the next day. Uh, so you could potentially use that. Ask your surgeons if they have those. Uh, so these can be cannulated. Uh, there was a study, they were able to use 40% accuracies within 72 hours. You should be able to use more of those. Another one is strategy is do not forget the good catheter. And good catheter is your peritoneal dialysis catheter. I know there are some logistics issues uh, in getting PD fluid everywhere. Not every country has that. But if you can do that, PD is a really good strategy uh, and you should uh, not forget that. That's strategy number eight. Strategy number nine is the gift of life. So if you have a patient who can get a transplant from someone, if you have a, um, if they have a relative who can give them a kidney, uh, that is the probably the best gift uh, they, uh, anybody can ever have. Uh, because no matter what you do with uh, normal hemodialysis, you're going to give 10, 15% maximum uh, clearance with that. And this will give you much better clearance and, and will last you a much longer period of time and it's much cheaper than dialysis as well after the first year. Uh, one just thought, uh, just thought, uh, just, just to learn from the past, in the past uh, I know there were some seniors of mine who were sitting here and, and they, they were use, using this Scribner shunt and, and this was going outside. What it was doing though, it was maturing the vein. And some people have done that in some countries. I know some people have done in India uh, that when they needed to start somebody on dialysis, they put in this stimulus shunt, and when the vein got matured, they created a fistula. It did not take that long. So, so you could potentially learn from that. Now, if you try, I don't think you can buy this on Amazon.com anymore. Uh, so, don't try it at home. So, that will not be a good idea. So, that was that. So, let me just give you a final strategy. How should you react to a patient who shows up for dialysis? So, so if you have a patient who needs urgent dialysis, and urgent is not like right now, but probably in one to two weeks, and, and you can evaluate. A lot of times it is in our mind that this patient needs dialysis. I have seen patients who are coming to me for placement of a catheter who are feeling just fine. Like, why do you need to start dialysis today with a catheter? Because my doctor told me, why my creatinine is eight. You are not having any symptom. You can still get a fistula. Let it mature. Just wait. There is no benefit of starting dialysis early. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you all remember the ideal study and other studies. Uh, there's, uh, when we start dialysis, we actually start their demise earlier. So that's not a good, good, good strategy. So if you can wait, start with a fistula. If you cannot wait, you, you can put in a PD catheter. You can start in three weeks. And if you really, uh, uh, and if you need two weeks, you can put in a standard graft. But if you want to start within one to two weeks, you can still start the rapid start PD. Um, I don't, uh, this is a PD we are used, put in a catheter, uh, wait for 72 hours or as much time as you can give and start with a slow, uh, a, a low volume PD, supine 500 cc in, uh, inflow only. Uh, so you do that, and you can get by using the PD catheter. So I have not talked about the catheter yet. Uh, and then if you need to still dialyze them within a day or two, you can put early use AV graft, and you can avoid all that three to four months of a, a catheter and waiting for the fistula to mature. So there are a number of uh, ways you can do that. 
So what about the patient who needs dialysis right now? So I've seen, and I'm sure you have seen, BUN is uh, uh, 200 and their creatinine is uh, 20 and they're, they are in pulmonary edema. You, you got to do something for them. So you can start a temporary catheter or a terminal catheter, whatever you want to do. But right away, uh, you, you can go to early use drafts. Uh, you can start urgent to start PD. Uh, and later on, once, once the graft fails, you can even move on to AV fish lab, but hopefully the graft will last you for a long period of time. And that's another way you can avoid three to four months of catheter. So there are a number of strategies that I have uh, shown you. But what is the ultimate strategy? What is the ultimate thing? It's all in our culture, in our mind, in our processes. And if we are prepared for it, we should use a fistula first and catheter last strategy. Uh, and, and you should get the catheter out and cap catheter never in paradigm. So, so that's your ultimate uh, uh, strategy. I would like to thank my friend Dr. Roy Chaudhary, uh, many of his slides I've used. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time. So I hope I on time here. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one minute, uh, regarding the uh, HERO or the hemodialysis reliable outflow, uh, it can be uh, a rescue therapy for this patient with multiple uh, venous stenosis, and uh, how can you use it, please? Sure, uh, so the question is about the HERO catheter, and HERO is H-E-R-O, so it's, uh, the full form is hemodialysis reliable outflow. And this is not a catheter that you want to use in the beginning, but if you talk about the central vein stenosis, so people who have had previous catheters, bad central vein, you do angioplasty, it occludes again, you put a stent, it occludes again, and it's not staying open. So in those people, if you want an AV access, what you do is you put this hero device. What is a hero? I should have put in a picture, but because I, I see that there is interest about it. Uh, so this is uh, something, uh, it's a graft. So you put in a graft, but there is no way to connect to it. So, 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 so now what you do is you connect it to a catheter and everything is subcutaneous. And it, it goes through that stenosed area. And because this is a catheter, it will, it will keep that area open. So, so in essence, it's a hybrid, it's a graft catheter device. Uh, it has its own issues uh, because it's a long tube. In, you know from the poesy Poise's law uh, that longer tubes have higher resistance. It no. tends to clot more. You, are, you still have a catheter in there, so this can get right into your thrombus. It can get infected. But it's a rescue therapy like, like you rightly said. Uh, 